Hi Larry. Um, it's brilliant to be able to sit with you again. Um, we've had the pleasure of meeting a few times so far. Um, and we're sitting in your show, um, which is an incredibly varied, complex, multi-generational, international exhibition. So how about we start by explaining the beginnings of the show um, and understanding how this maybe differs from the Hong Kong edition. Okay. Well, before I start, I want to thank Ben Brown, the gallery here, uh, Amanda, Emily, uh, Katie, um, this has been a journey. I mean, it's been really interesting. These conversations Amanda and I and Emily have been having actually for the last several years, trying to identify a way that we can collaborate, something that would be special, something that would be interesting. Um, and we decided to you know, do the show in Hong Kong first with the assumption and hope that you know, COVID protocol would have been lifted. Um, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Um, but it made it more interesting. I mean, so basically, we were trying to figure out a show to do together. And initially, uh, I was thinking about you know presenting a group show of artists from the African diaspora. And I was talking to a friend of mine, Didier William, and he was like, "That's what they expect from you. You know, do something a little bit more interesting." Um, and then this, when I went back to Quasi's book, um, Ghost of Empire, which I read about a decade ago, and it was actually upon the suggestion of K. D. Wiley. Um, and thinking about how empire is constructed. Um, and also for me, I'm, you know, as a Ghanaian American, trying to understand what are the variables that have kind of informed how present day Ghana and a lot of uh, post-colonial countries have been constructed. And so um, talking to Didier and then talking to another friend, Tammy, who is a Vietnamese uh, American artist, and just doing research, I came to understand that there were a lot more um, in conversation when it came to the African diaspora, Caribbean diaspora, and the Asian diaspora, South, A South Asian diaspora. And you know, growing up in America, you kind of taught, you know, Africans were taken from Africa to North America, South America. Maybe you had some in Europe, and then you know, in Asia, you just had the Opium War, Indochina War, and that's really it. And there was actually a lot more intersection, a lot more overlap. And so I was interested in what would an exhibition look like bringing those, those ideas, bringing those thoughts, bringing artists who are thinking about concerns around migration, immigration, um, slavery, identity, um, into one, one, one exhibition. And so we did the first part, uh, March to May. And for me, it was really great just to kind of see the feedback, talking to people on social media. Um, a lot of collectors and artists were really thankful because of these are not conversations that you would normally have in Hong Kong. Um, and you know, also I wanted to kind of create a bit of a mirror because I was observing what was happening in Hong Kong with the protests. Um, and the last time I went to China was 2000, right when it was being handed back. And so to think about, you know, that layered history and that all these, all these places have these layered histories and how can art, you know, highlight those things, getting us to think about those things, getting us to ask questions um, and challenge these structures that you know, many of us have just kind of conformed to. Um, of those books I've read about Empire and I'm really enjoying sort of getting into Kwasi's book, um, what I've noticed is they try to frame Empire as a sort of preamble to the modern world, so as a way of trying to understand capitalism or the free movement of people or global trade. But in fact, I think that it's pr probably quite different to the modern world. And I think that because of that difference, Empire is an interesting way of looking at history, but also looking back in order to inform the present. How, have you, how are your sort of aspects um, how has the way that you've seen Empire changed in the way that you've created this exhibition and what have you learned about Empire in doing this show? Um, I've learned that it's, it's, it's sneaky, mm -hmm. it's nefarious, um, it's, it's like beet juice. Anybody who drinks beet juice, it just gets <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> you think you've cleaned it, but it's still it's there. It's still present. <laughs> and, you know, I'm I've tried to not engage it in a binary in terms of good or bad, mm -hmm. because beautiful things have come from that. You know, when I think about like this picture over here um, from Lad Ladbroke Grove um, by Paul Anthony Smith, right, and thinking about Carnival, 
where you know my friend Sly here has a, a rum bar tra trailer happiness in Portobello mm -hmm. and we were talking about how like it attracts over two million people mm -hmm. right but this came out of an well carnival in general is an act of resistance right and celebration of pride but for um, Notting Hill in particular it comes after you know uh, the teddy boys you know bombing black homes in Notting Hill right mm -hmm. And the, the community trying to find ways to galvanize, get together, celebrate. Um, and so I was also interested in what are the things that emerge in spite of particular challenges, um, whether it be structural, whether it be cultural, whether it be social, socially economic. Um, and I think with the book, I was really struck by the strategies that were used, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, what the Brit and, and I didn't want to focus primarily on the British Empire, I think Empire in general, mm -hmm. but for the sake of this conversation, like just how Iraq was kind of constructed, right? And what they would do is they would go in, observe who's the minority group, put them in power, and then you have them fighting against each other, and then you're able to control the whole, right? And seeing how that strategy is even still being applied now, whether mm -hmm. it's you know Tories versus Labour. You know, which I, I learned about. I didn't really realize how conservative our your new finance minister was, um, but how this binary is used as a strategy to control people, um, and so how can we create more awareness about that so we can make more informed decisions when big when big decisions need to be made. How did that influence um, the curatorial selection of the of the artists, um, and how? Did you sort of construct which um, pockets of history of um, of uh, geography that you wanted to represent in the exhibition? So for me, I was trying to think about history, trying to think about forms of storytelling, mm -hmm. um, whether that be personal, historical, or memory. But then also trying to make sure that we were highlighting parts of the diaspora in terms of Asia that normally aren't in the conversation. So mm -hmm. you have like Maya here who's Filipino, um, and then you also have Jean, who's Filipino, right? Um, or even Tia Whitney Lake, who's Cambodian. And she's the first Cambodian artist that I've met. Obviously, I'm sure there are many. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to access points of view that aren't now normally elevated in the art world. Um, but then also thinking about like Father Kemi's work, which is very personal. You know, and she moves between Lagos and London and thinking about what does it mean to navigate a bicultural identity, mm -hmm. right? And that's also kind of the impetus for this show because for me it's like, although I was born in New York, you know, I identify as being Ghanaian first, right? right? You rarely see me, you know, <laughs> I'm American, like, right. you know, because this awareness is beginning to kind of expand. Um, and then I think in the case of like Miguel, for example, um, he's Afro-Caribbean, but has spent you know, almost two decades living in China, went to art school in China. When I met him, I was kind of confused as to like, how is a Dominican guy <laughs> make it to China? And then he's married to a Chinese woman, so he's very kind of ingrained. And then you see that in his work where he's trying to create this fusion between you know, his Dominican history, history, heritage, Afro-Latino heritage, but then his... Um, new heritage, I guess, you know, having lived in China for almost 20 years. Picking back up on um, your point about identifying ourselves, um, I also really resonated with Father Kevin's work as a Nigerian-British diaspora myself, and I think what I really loved about it is that it engaged with this idea of storytelling and who, how we sort of negotiate between um, the two identities and mm -hmm. how we sort of manage um, which stories or which uh, collective histories we engage with. Um, and what I think is great about this show in comparison, well not in comparison, but looking at the history of shows that you know, negotiate with empire, which are often about um, the burden of truth telling from the descendants of empire, is that this is looking at resistance as a sort of um, reclamation of joy as well. Um, so I think it'd be interesting to maybe unpack um, a little bit about Fadikemi's work um, mm -hmm. and sort of talking about maybe the folk art imagery and um, yeah, why these works and what does that say to this exhibition? Well, so I think this work, you know, when you think about 
you know, being first generation, being an immigrant, family is the first thing that comes to mind. And so this is a picture of a young family. Um, she uses this uh, color blue uh, because she says for her, it's, it's almost darker than the color black, right? And it's another way to kind of identify herself, but then also family, people close to her. Um, she's also written a lot of texts. And so she's thinking about poetry and she's thinking about these figures in conversation. You know, you have my, you know, my love, my sweet tenderness. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was, you know, kind of struck by this intersection between like image and text. It's decorative, you have pattern. So I'm thinking about Bati and Adam, where's Adam? Adam DeBoer who's an artist in the exhibition. He made this beautiful painting in addition to other works in the show, using Batik techniques to make the work. She talks about it as a, a mirror of sorts, and her trying to navigate her identity as someone who was born, I believe she was born in Nigeria, living in the UK, and how do you maintain a sense of self, right? Because I think, I think, I'm, you know, I can probably say this now, I'm 42. Um, in my 20s, it was so much about uh, assimilating. Yeah. It was so much about fitting in. You know, I know growing up in New York, like, proclaiming your African identity was like, not a good thing. You got made fun of, right? And so it's interesting to kind of see a generation that is proclaiming their identity, do their artwork, telling stories. Um, and Africa oral, oral tradition, you know, typically tr trumps the written word. But I would say Nigeria is, definitely has a history of incredible writers. Yeah. So I think her ability to kind of tap into like picture making, but then also storytelling um, is what drew me to her. But then also she's trained as an architect. Um, so what is an architectural mind and approach um, to art making look like? And I think for me, that was something that was really interesting to, to kind of explore with her. And then this picture, as a reference um, to a Frida Kahlo painting um, over here around. You guys think it's going to see it after the talk. Um, and thinking about Frida, the blue house that she has in Mexico, what Frida represents for a lot of people. Um, you know, she talks about this mirroring, but also just looking at this relationship between these two women, right? The face is very solemn, the gaze is direct. Um, but it makes you wonder what are they thinking, what are they feeling, um, and I and I like the fact that you know her work, in addition to a lot of work in the in the exhibition, invites you to kind of look at the details. It's not something that you can just glance at because there's a lot that meets the eye. I think your point about assimilation um, really resonated with me as someone who's been navigating, obviously being curated, being very visible in the art world, and I think it's one of the sort of hangovers of empire, as I guess your knee-jerk reaction is to try to um, not draw too much attention to yourself. But I think what's interesting now with the uh, resurgence of Black Lives Matter and with like the sort of readdressing and, and overdue attention to black art or to artists of colour is that we're now seeing artists, art makers, art professionals being able to really embrace themselves um, with sort of unabashed joy and also just sort of, yeah, be taking up space. Um, I think that's one of the great things I loved about Paul Anthony Smith's work because mm -hmm. it's looking at Notting Hill Carnival, which, as you, as you mentioned, started as a and still remains um, an activist um, event. And I think that that work um, is particularly interesting. I wonder if we could elaborate about the techniques that are put onto the photographs. Okay, so Paul um, came to the UK in 2019. His mom lives here, so he's, he's here back and forth. And he documented a number of images during Carnival. And so what he does is he takes the images and he tries to isolate the, you know, something that will make a picture. Um, some pictures he'll spray paint, add a little bit of painting, but in this one, it's more about the picotage. So he picotages the, the figure. So he's literally using a tool to kind of pick up the surface of the image. Um, and for me, you know, looking at this picture from here, it's like, if you move from left to right, it almost kind of functions as a lenticular, one. But then two, it's also kind of a commentary on visibility and invisibility. Um, and so for me, I'm, 
I love Paul's work and I, I love how poetic it can be. Uh, but even just looking in the lower right corner, just looking at the two facial expressions, you know, one of joy kind of in the, in the foreground and then the one in the background is for me kind of a little bit more aggressive and potentially resistant. Um, and I like that, you know, one is the photograph and, and I was talking to uh, Dina Lawson, who's a friend, and we were just talking about the fact that there's not enough photographs that are being included in this conversation unless it's like more historical or kind of archive, right? And so how can pictures kind of be um, uh, a vehicle for this conversation? I think it's something that I really thought about also when we were putting together the exhibition. I think what's interesting about um, the work, his work is that it also sort of looks at the ideas of class, mm -hmm. um, which is another legacy of empire, the social structures um, that sort of lie in the fault lines of contemporary global politics. And I think what's interesting um, to maybe touch on is maybe the differences in class systems between America and the UK, um, and whether you can speak to how maybe you see, identify any differences to do with race and class and cultural production here or in, in, in Europe or outside of America and your experience within America. Well, I mean, I can speak for America because that's where I live. I think, uh, unfortunately, race is kind of like something that kind of leads a lot of dialogue and tension because of just you know, how the country has been constructed. I mean, a lot of the wealth is off the backs of slaves. Um, the social economic piece, I think a lot of that is kind of driven by which part of the country you live in. Um, but what's been interesting is that, you know, spending the last couple of days here, I've been trying to figure out, okay, what is the similarities? What is the difference? Um, because yes, sir, I've seen and read about issues of race here in the United Kingdom, but it's definitely a class thing, right? Because I know, you know people of color who drive Bentleys are well off, right? And they look down upon somebody who's working class. You know, I have family who works at Tesco, you know, and they probably would be, you know, denied access to particular places. Um, but I think that's also partly why I put together the exhibition to kind of like unpack these questions for myself. A lot of times, you know, I make a show because I have questions and I'm trying to find answers. Um, and hopefully through dialogue, through conversation, um, I'm able to get a better understanding of, you know, history that informs current policy. Um, so like, you know, for example, this painting by Living Yen is really interesting, um, Bongo, uh, because it tells the story of the sugar plantations in Hawaii which like, I wasn't aware that, you know, when we think, when the way we were taught sugar plantations, workers, that was all in the South, yeah. right? But what I learned through this picture is that there were actually Filipinos, Japanese, and Chinese who were working on the plantations in Hawaii. And a lot of the plantation owners found it difficult to pronounce the names. So instead of identifying by name, they gave them this bongo number, right? And so to think about how you're kind of reduced to just a number, right? And then for me, thinking about the prison industrial complex, where a lot of people who are in prison are reduced to just a number. That's what their identity is reduced to. Um, and I think also what's important to point out is that you know, Black Lives Matter definitely has been a catalyst um, in this conversation. But for me, I also kind of realized the importance of acknowledging uh, the need for Asian communities, Latinx, Native American communities to really come together in order to push against um, a lot of this oppressive behavior, a lot of this oppressive policy. Um, and that was kind of the other reason why I wanted to, for this show to look at the intersection of the African and the Asian diaspora um, and look at where there's overlap. Look at, like I was talking with um, John Comfort last night and he had talked to me about um, um, Asian activists who were in Paris, who were part of like the liberation movement for Africa in the 20s. Mm -hmm. And this is information I'm like, oh wow, I didn't even know that, right? Yeah. So this is just another example of these linkages that, you know, art, you know, creates a catalyst for those conversations and gets us thinking about, okay, what else do we not know? You know, what other relationships or linkages or things that we can learn from exist to help us navigate this current climate? 
I think art is a great tool to find those overlaps and those links. Um, are there any sort of um, un unexpected uh, connections that you came across whilst curating the show? Um, that's a good question. Because sometimes when you put things together, you start to see sort of echoes that start to sort of like bind or some things I think of thinking noticed. about Adam's work and um, Herman Anderson's work mm -hmm. in conversation. Um, this piece, you know, beautiful painting, um, and I was looking at the notes and we were talking and thinking about the, you know, referencing a Wolfgang Tillman photograph, right? But Adam also trained here um, at, at Chelsea for his MA. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to kind of like, you know, see him navigate, you know, Dutch, Indonesian background, trained here, and then now using his practice as a platform to, you know, help him get a better understanding of his, his own personal history. Um, I think this piece, this Brianna piece, is interesting, also mm -hmm. by Miguel, um, which is um, <laughs> referencing the deity Ma Mami Water, yeah. which um, if you practice Vodun, Condomble, Santeria, um, we have Mami Water in Nigeria yeah. too. <laughs> you know, um, it's this deity uh, aligned with water, right? Yeah. But it's also this picture that references the self-portrait of Beyond Taylor, who was unfortunately murdered um, by the police in Kentucky. But in <coughs> talking to people about this piece, they meant I was reading Edward Enfold's book, and he talks about Sherry. She was paralyzed. Mm -hmm. I think Sherry Noss. Um, where the police uh, invaded her place. This has happened in London, right? Um, and I think, because typically, you know, America's a pretty violent place, unfortunately. And I think when you don't live there, you know, you kind of say those things just happen there, right? And to see examples of that happening here in the UK, I think even we were talking, Emily and I were talking about um, a rapper who was unfortunately killed yeah. recently. Um, so I think for me it was just important that like these things are not a binary, it's not neither here nor there, you know, they affect us all, right? Um, and how can we have more awareness around these things and really kind of push back against a lot of this oppressive behavior? I think it's for me kind of a, a through line that I saw, you know, throughout a lot of the works. Um, thinking again to the, to the present day, um, I think it's very poignant, as Katie said, that we are um, living in very much a watershed moment in history mm -hmm. um, as empire is being negotiated and also lots of contemporary discussion about what empire means um, in the present day is starting to come, to come up. And I read a really interesting article by Afua Hirsch who was talking a lot about how um, the admiration of empire is very much sort of drummed into us, especially as a diaspora, it becomes an unquestionable standard. And so I was curious about how you, you see um, this exhibition um, relating and agitating or complementing the contemporary discussions that are going on currently. Well, my, my hope is that, you know, given, you know, what's happened in the last week, it invites us to start asking questions. I think a lot of times we kind of take things for face value. Um, but there's a lot of things that are happening underneath that come from generations and generations and generations of policy that, you know, over time we just don't question, right? And so, like, you know, I've, I've talked to a number of people about, you know, now you have this new PM yeah. and you have this most multicultural cabinet, but talking to, you know, different folks, they're like, but it's a super conservative Yeah, cabinet. it's not what you think it is. You know, so, like... <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm sure if I lived here and I'm like, oh, multi, like I would be excited. But mm -hmm. like, even last night, I was at a restaurant and I think one of the cabinet members just happened to be there. Oh, oh. Uh, which one? Yeah, she's Nigerian. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, okay. Kelly. Yeah. And so I just like, <laughs> the temperature at the dinner table I'm really rose. <laughs> I was like, oh, should I, should I go say hi and take a picture? And they were like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> but but it goes back to your question about like race and class, right? Yeah. So it's like you now have an assimilation as an well. Assimilation. And like they were just kind of recanted to me a lot of her ideas. I mean, even, you know, Quasi has some, you know, questionable perspectives, right? And so 
in America, like we, you you've know, got Candy's, um, what's her name, the Trump supporter, Candy Sellers. Oh yeah. <laughs> You're like, let's look at Yeah, that. but the thing, but I think it's 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 I won't say it's good or bad. Yeah. But it's it's interesting that you are able to have this kind of spectrum of perspective, right? You know, that is super conservative or super liberal, right? But it's like a little problematic when you, you have folks who are in decision making positions and not really kind of like coming to to, to grips with this history, right? Um, and I think even, and not to be blasphemous of, of the queen, but I think a lot of those questions are coming up now, yeah. right? When you think about uh, the speech she made in Cape Town, I think it's 47 to 49, which also is kind of the year that apartheid starts, right? And then there, there isn't questioning of that, right? Or, you know, is it a question of like her and her service? Or is it now just a question of monarchy as a structure, right? And I'm kind of curious to see what will happen with a lot of the Commonwealth nations. Will they go the way of Barbados, mm -hmm. you know, or will they kind of maintain uh, their loyalty to the empire, right? But also the other thing that I was trying to think about with this show is also like, you know, America's implication in this, right? Because Puerto Rico is one of the oldest territories. Um, in history now, right? So Puerto Rico is not a state. You know, it's a territory just like Guam, mm -hmm. American Samoa. And so for me, trying to reflect on like, what is America's role kind of in this like imperial discourse? Bringing it um, again back into, I guess, a more British lens of the empire, um, I was thinking <coughs> about how empire affected the cultural production of artists um, mm -hmm. in England um, and how it also disrupted the cultural production of artists who were not white, who, who were working at that time. Um, they would be displayed if they were in a more anthropological or ethnographic um, way of display, and that's why. Um, as you know, with the work that I like to curate, and definitely with this show, this disruption of a Eurocentric canon mm -hmm. is always um, in incredibly interesting for, from a contemporary perspective. Um, but also very utopic for um, a future of rewriting a canon, rewriting our art history, and going back and bringing up artists um, who have had undeserved detention. So very utopically, I'm very curious about what your hopes are for the future of um, of this sort of work of curating these types of shows of acceptability and um, I guess full actual like with gusto embracing of these narratives. Yeah, I think for me, you know, again, thanks to the gallery continuing to provide these platforms for the artists, um, you know, but doing it with rigor, not doing it just because, right? Uh, but I think the other part is like, how do you also provide agency to the artist to talk about the spectrum of things, right? It doesn't need to just be about like colonial ideas per se, mm -hmm. right? What are the other things that interest artists and really kind of uh, inviting artists to be artists, you know? So talking about, you know, whether it's labor or this morning I went to a talk with uh, Teresita Fernandez, thinking about environment, thinking about landscape. Um, so I think giving artists the freedom to talk about a myriad of topics Mm -hmm. But I think continuing to support um, the artists that look different from what the art world has traditionally celebrated, right? Um, and that's kind of been my MO, you know, yeah. since 2008. It's like, you know, who are the artists that look like me or whose stories um, align with my way of seeing the world? And how can I use my resources, relationships, interests? Um, to give them voice, right? And allow their stories to help expand how we see ourselves and the world around us, right? So like Tina is a great example, you know, because I, would, you know, I visited with her and she was just talking about her experiences like a Cambodian American and Long Beach, California, and so much of it felt like my upbringing in the Bronx in New York City. Um, and so for me, like also kind of really thinking about immigrant voices, first generation voices, who again are navigating this bicultural identity and trying to figure out how do you use your practice as a vehicle to open up these conversations, whether they be personal, you know, in this case of Father Kami, um, historical, thinking about memory. 
And so, you know, for me, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, but there's no, like, end point, right? No. You know, I think it's this continual work um, and continuing to do the best you can to be rigorous um, in your explorations, in the questions you're asking or inviting artists to kind of ponder on. Uh, but also, you know, challenging myself, you know, and not resting on my laurels. Um, I think it's probably a good time to ask if there's any questions from the audience. Hi, Lynn. <laughs> Hi, Larry. My name's Lynn Blades. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your curation with us. I'm curious to know, um, obviously, you've had to ask yourself a lot of questions during this curation, uh, and I assume that there were, that you had a lot of personal insight. Is there anything in particular, any significant learning or um, discovery that you've had that you will carry on and it will be impactful on your journey ahead? Um, realizing that it, it, as much as I think I know, I know nothing. Um, because talking to these artists and there's all these kind of, I guess, micro histories, you know, um, that I'm just not aware of. And it's, 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 for me, driven the curiosity. And so kind of using that as um, a catalyst to kind of continue to search and figure out what information am I not aware of, right? So like learning about, you know, these activists who were working towards liberation for African countries in the 20s. You know, and it wasn't just African, Caribbean, but it was also Asian, right? And why is this not common information, right? Um, so I think, you know, just the process humbled me, right? And I think also really trying to to the best of my ability, imagine what, how would this show fit within this context being, you know, situated in London versus in Hong Kong, right? Um, and allowing for that discourse and, and not doing the typical American thing that I know everything, you know? Um, and really just kind of coming to this as a student, you know? And for me, you know, this is, this is gonna be a continual dialogue that I'll have different forms. I'm grateful to all the artists who've agreed to participate because they've taught me a lot and hopefully as you get to spend time with the show, uh, you guys will learn some things as well. Thank you.